Hello, everyone. Uh, today, we are honored to have Dr. Sophia Rose Arjana with us. Dr. Arjana is an Associate Professor of Religious Studies in the Department of Philosophy and Religion at Western Kentucky University. She's a very well-published scholar who has written on several subjects in the study of Islam, such as pilgrimage, Islamophobia, popular culture, and feminism. Her first book, Muslims in the Western Imagination, was published by Oxford University Press which examines the history of anti-Muslim rhetoric in Europe and North America. Her other books include Pilgrimage in Islam, Traditional and Modern Practices, Veiled Superheroes, Islam, Feminism, and Popular Culture. And her latest book is, is, buying, Buddha, is buying Buddha, Studying Rumi, Orientalism and the Mystical Marketplace, which focuses on the commodification of mysticism in North America and Europe. Uh, Sophia, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Thank you for having me. So as a first question, I'd like to know how the whole idea of this book started. And uh, also there are already, I'm not sure about books, but there are already some random articles on how elements of other cultures or religions have been appropriated in the West. So how different did you approach this subject in your book? Um, thank you. That's a great question to start off with. Well, to begin with, the, the inception point was actually in grad school. And I had this incredible professor whose name is uh, Ted Vile. And he went to University of Chicago and um, I took a number of courses from him. And one of, the, one of the books that we read was Charles Taylor's A Secular Age. And one of the things that that book brings up is the difference between pre-modernity and modernity. And that one of the, one of the kind of qualities of modernity is this loss of enchantment or dis or what we might call disenchantment and some of that has to do with you know the enlightenment and some of it has to do with other things but one of the kind of questions that always stuck in my mind from that book and that that particular class that I took with Ted was well what happens to people that still want enchantment right so um th there may be a loss of enchantment and certainly there's these kinds of um, you know, process of processes of secularization, but there's also, you know, there's also enchantment and how do people get that if they live in a very, you know, kind of secularized society or a society where, um, where religion is privatized, right? Because in North America, re religion is often privatized. I mean, not always, but there's this kind of idea of like, you go to church on certain days, right? Um, and you, there's this kind of compartmentalization of religion, right? So that was one, one kind of idea that always kind of stuck in my mind. And then another book that I read, another course that I took with Ted um, was this, this book by Richard King uh, about Orientalism in India and about mysticism. And one of the things, I mean, I love Richard King's work. I think he's a, just a brilliant, brilliant scholar. And there was a number of questions that that book presented. And one of them, um, one of the things that, that Richard talks about in, in that book is mysticism as basically a Western category of knowledge, right? So, you, you know, we know that in religious studies, a lot of what we're working with are these kinds of Western concepts. And then we, as scholars, we kind of try to you know, figure out, well, how do we apply this, right, to these other, to these other traditions that are outside of Protestant Christianity, right, and it was one of the things that really stuck with me. I was also really interested in some of the other parts of that book that, that detail, you know, the role of British Orientalists in India and all that, and so there was a number of things, right, that kind of stuck in my mind. One of them was this idea of the search for enchantment. Another one was the appeal of the Orient, right? And that of course also came through reading people like Edward Said, who's been real, really influential on my work from the beginning. Um, and I was also, you know, interested in this whole question of how all the things come together in the commodification of religion, right? And mysticism. And so that was really, it was really a long process because um, I was in graduate school a long time ago. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that I did do is I went back and, and reread those texts, you know, several times and I still really had these questions. Now, one of the things that the book is interested in doing is showing how the search for enchantment is linked to the Orient, right? 
Um, and it's linked to these ideas about the exotification of particular religious traditions. And I'm not making the argument there that these are the only religions that are exoticized. And of course, you know, in North America, we have this, we have this issue with Native American traditions. I don't always like to say religions because um, one of my uh, former colleagues who, who, is, who is Native American often would remind us, you know, there's, there's often not a word for religion, right, in Native languages, right? So I try to try to not say that, but that, you know, that there's also these other traditions that have been exotified, as you mentioned them a little bit, but the main focus in the book is on these three, three of the large, you know, kind of most prominent religions, right, they're associated with the Orient, but that's really the process um, of how the book kind of came to be. And it was something that was really a long time coming because I thought about these issues um, mm -hmm. a long time and I just felt like it was time to write the book. And of course there's really fantastic work about the, the commodification of yoga, right? And there's a number of good works on that. And um, you know, there's really wonderful work on, for example, Rumi, right? <laughs> And how Rumi is commodified, but I really, I really do think that there's some links there. And one of the other reasons that I chose to look at Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam is that there's this concept in my book um, that I call muddled Orientalism, and this is kind of where like things get all kind of mixed up together. And so that's why it, it wasn't just a book that was titled, you know, Selling Rumi, <laughs> right? Um, because I felt it was important to talk to talk about those, those cohabitations. Thank you for the very comprehensive answer, I think. Uh, it was interesting what you mentioned about yoga. I remember I read an article some time ago. I don't remember the name of the person. I guess there was this American guy in, in 1920s who kind of popularized yoga in the States with his wife who was a dancer and they, they mixed elements of uh, gymnasium with yoga right and yeah and i also some time ago i watched this documentary don't remember the name but it was by louis Thoreau from bbc who went to india to see mm -hmm. who these gurus are and it, it was a very entertaining documentary uh and it was interesting to know a lot of them were white americans they were right. uh, revered even by the indians there right <laughs> yeah and uh as you have rightly mentioned, Buddhism has been, I mean, the commodification of Buddhism has been around for, for quite some time, a few decades. And, but with, it's interesting with Islam uh, because it has come to the forefront of Western imagination more recently, especially after 1911, and it's usually been vilified. So what is the allure of Islam in this respect? Now, what elements of that religion has been um, commodified or, or let's say orientalized? Right. So, I mean, I think that, I mean, one of the things to think about with Islam is to kind of think about Muslim bodies, right? And that Muslim bodies have long been exotified. I mean, in my first book, I talk a lot about the vilification and the dehumanization of Muslim bodies, especially Muslim men, you know, male bodies. But there's also this kind of other part of it right, which is um, exotifying and fantasizing about colonized bodies, right? And so there's always kind of been that, you know, since at least since Orientalism and um, the kind of desire for the colonized other, if you will, right? Um, and the other thing that we do find in Orientalism is this kind of notion about you know, and this begins with the European Orientalists, you know, there's these, there's these excerpts from people like Lane and others where they talk about arriving at some oriental port, right? Some ports or harbor in the Orient and they were like meeting the bridegroom or the bride, you know, and, um, you know, and how they were seeking all this kind of power, right? And in, in all this knowledge. And of course, some of that had to do with territory, but some of it also has to do with these notions about how the Orient is the place where kind of, you know, original knowledge and where all, all this kind of mystical spiritual power is located. And, you know, and that's, that's kind of one way, you know, to think about it. Um, I think, you know, one of, um, you know, maybe one of the other things to think about here, of course, is somebody like Rumi, 
<laughs> and so we also have this thing that happens with Sufism, um, which is, is, is this effort, and this has been an effort, you know, by some scholars early on, but we see this a lot kind of more in, in you know, kind of the social culture of Sufism to remove um, Islam from, you know, from these figures like Rumi um, and to misinterpret, you know, what Rumi was really writing about. And so we have all that. And one of the things that I, I do think is important about all of these processes of modern mysticism is the kind of whitewashing of tradition. So, I mean, you see this with kind of, you know, something like the Hanuman Festival in Boulder, right? Which I write about a little bit. And if you go to their webpage, you just see like these mostly white yoga teachers. Right. And so, so you, you kind of see that. Um, you also see with a lot of yoga practices, the erasure, you know, or erasing of the Hindu elements, because then that kind of makes it safe for white folks. And I say this as a, as a white person, you know, who's a convert, but, you know, I also try to be fairly conscious about these things. Right. Um, and when these traditions are marketed in a way, that removes some of those religious essences from them. It also detaches the people that practice those religions, right? And the people that practice those religions obviously mostly are white. And then it makes it safe, you know, um, for people that are uncomfortable with that. And I think that that's something, I mean, I, I talk about, a, you know, somewhat in my book about, um, you know, white mysticism and the kind of whitewashing <laughs> Um, of these traditions. And that's another thing that we see with Islam as well um, through Sufism, um, where you see a lot of people that are engaged in kind of these new age Sufi practices. Like they, they don't, like they wouldn't, you know, I, I, I mean, they'll identify with Rumi, but they're like not gonna identify with Malcolm. You know what I mean? Like Malcolm X or Muhammad Ali, like that's not gonna be their thing. So, I mean, I think that you can, you can kind of see how it works, right? It's, it's very problematic from a kind of, um, you know, if you're coming at it from a kind of view of thinking about race and empire, it's a pretty problematic uh, process that's going on. Thank you. Uh, what you said about yoga reminded me of a video I saw some time ago on YouTube. It was a, it was a parody, Gandhi in a yoga class. So uh -huh. it was how Gandhi would feel if we would go into a yoga class uh, and it's only a three minute video, which is hilarious, but there are very, very interesting elements of that that you can really uh, relate to, especially when you read the book. Yeah. Right. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned mysticism and Sufism. You have this wonderful quote in your book from Carl Ernst. Uh, so I do, the term mysticism has been, I guess, one of those uh, really misunderstood terms. There are different interpretations and uh, different definitions of the term. So I was wondering if you could tell us what mysticism is and then, what does Carl Ernst mean when he says, um, just quoting from your book, that early scholars of religion saw Sufism as an attractive system precisely to the degree that it denies the law of Muhammad and approaches Christianity. So in a way, was it embedded into Christianity uh, with some Islamic elements of it erased? Right, so, so I think um, what, uh, what Carl is kind of talking about there is that Sufism has often been framed in a way that erases or attempts to erase the fact that it's an Islamic tradition. And anybody that's, I mean, you're a religious scholar, you know this as well, like anybody that's a religious scholar knows that it's an Islamic tradition. Um, and you can try to make these arguments about how it's not, but it doesn't really work when you like look at the evidence, right? And look at sources. So um, one of the things that's happened with Sufism, and this has to kind of, this has to do with this, this category of mysticism, right? Is that, um, Sufism has been framed as a kind of essential universalistic tradition, right? And, and there have been religious scholars and some of them are, you know, quoted in my book that have made, I mean, this is a while back, but they have made these arguments like, oh, well, you know, this isn't really Islam. It's really talking about, you know, this kind of essential, um, you know, experience. And one of the problems with that um, and one of the, and this has to do with the problem of how mysticism is often framed is that when, then when they actually talk about what that essential experience is, it's really an experience that is really Christian, 
right? Because that's where they're coming from. That's what, that's the framework that they're working in. Um, and of course, it's ridiculous to say <laughs> that Sufism is not um, in Islamic traditions, but, um, you know, people have said, said this. Now, one of the other things about, about, um, about the kind of idea of mysticism, and this, there's a whole kind of part of my book where I, you know, write about the attempts to define mysticism and, or, you know, spirituality. And they're often the attempts kind of result in this very fluid, not really saying anything specific to language, because the effort there is to try to fit every religious tradition that has ever existed and exists in this one framework. And when we look at Sufism, one of the things um, that we see are these efforts to, um, you know, define Sufism in certain ways. And it's kind of a mess. And so, you know, I wrote about this a little bit in my book on pilgrimage of like, you know, how do we, how we talk about Sufism because the way that scholars have talked about it has often been kind of problematic. And um, one, of the, one of the things that I, I do like that I've seen is, is this, there was this article by Elliot Bazzano who's a really interesting scholar in North America. And he wrote about how Sufism, you know, definitely should not be thought of as a sect or something kind of different than kind of normative Islam, right? Which is one of the ways it's been framed, but how it's more a set of practices and kind of attitudes that are focused on religious devotion. And I think that's really useful because when you actually look at, you know, you look at a particular place in the world that has a lot of Muslims in it and you try to kind of write about Sufism. Okay, so what is Sufism in this place? What you find is that, well, people may have a teacher. They may actually be in an order, right? There are people that do that, but there are a lot of people that don't do that and they still, you know, may recite zikr or they still may like visit, you know, certain Wali, certain saints, or they may, you know, do all these other Sufi things. And so that's one of, one of the kind of problems with it. And I'm working on this project now um, where there's, you know, at a minimum two chapters <laughs> that kind of deal with Sufi stuff. And one of the things that I'm, you know, saying there um, is that there's different ways, you know, that we can think about it. Cause certainly, you know, some, some people like being the, the kind of structure of being in an order, but there's also a lot of um, other ways that people have these devotional practices. They also would not say, I'm a Sufi, right? They wouldn't go around like saying that. I mean, that would be weird. They might say, oh, like my teacher is like whoever, you know, but they're not gonna say that, right? Um, so, you know, it's, it's complicated. And I think that, you know, scholars are obviously now a lot more careful about it. But it really goes back to this issue of how do we define mysticism? Right. That's where you bring the term white mysticism in the book. Uh, right. And, uh, and also the poor mystics, which I love that uh, terminology because that's something I've, I haven't seen, but I've seen a lot of people who go to, the, to Turkey, Iran, or in Asian countries, and they talk and they come back and talk about people there. And I have this idea that they're so idealizing or romanticizing the, in a reductive way, the, 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 different experiences of life and the lifestyle and also the religious practices of the people there. And uh, you, you have the, these two wonderful terms in the book, pastron, pastorpreneur and imamopreneur. And I especially love the imamopreneur. And you talk about Joel Austin and Hamza Yusuf. And I used to listen to Joel Austin a lot simply to improve my English. And I loved him because he didn't talk so much about the Bible and he was right. about love. Right. Uh, and until I did some more research and I was kind of put off because uh, I guess the term you have used pastor and pastorpreneur is, is, is a very telling one. Uh, so I was wondering if you could describe what you mean by these two terms, and especially imamopreneur, because uh, with Hamza Yusuf, it's not, maybe it's not so, he's not so much known even in, in other countries as, as Joel Austin. Yeah. So, you know, and I always want to be careful. I'm talking about, about these people because I know they have a lot of followers, right? And they'll start to get emails and attacks on social media or whatever. But um, yeah, so I mean, that whole idea of the imampreneur are, you know, people that are often, you know, very moral upstanding people 
right? And very devoted to the path of Islam. But also they kind of know how to market their teachings, right? And what they're doing to a kind of wide um, segment of the Muslim population. And then they, you know, gain a following and they become really successful, right? And one of the things I, I think that they're tapping into, I mean, you can see, I mean, with Osteen, it's really easy to see this because you can, and I actually have my students, I'm teaching this course that uses the book that we're talking about. Um, and it's a course on popular culture in the religious marketplace. And I have my students actually go to his website and look at his products. And it's really interesting because it's, you know, it's a lot of kind of self-actualization, a lot of like personal growth. Like here's a tote bag that says, you know, whatever, like start a new day today or, you know, that kind of thing. And so, you know, these are individuals that are really clever at marketing things. And there's this really wonderful book by a Persian scholar. Um, the last name is Shirazi. Um, and that book is called Brand Islam. It's a wonderful book. And it's about kind of the marketing of halal products. Um, and one of the things that book um, talks about, and I, I do mention it in my book, is this idea of a clever tool. Like there's these certain kind of marketing techniques that are used, right, to make products appealing. And oftentimes they're religious products. And so that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about Yusuf or we're talking about, you know, Osteen is that they are marketing religious products. I mean, we might not look at the tote bag and immediately think that's religious, but people think it is because the people that buy them are like, oh, I'm buying this because because Joel Osteen is selling it right on his website. And so, you know, I think there's a whole kind of thing about that. Um, and my students immediately recognized how clever the marketing is, right? And this is really about the, also, you know, who your consumer is, right? And so you, if you have a lot of consumers that are, I mean, maybe they're kind of like Generation X or Generation Z or whatever, and they're not like so into religious authority, <laughs> you, you can use this particular language, right? There's a particular language that's used um to appeal to those consumers right and whether you're doing this because you want to make money which is certainly the case i would say with somebody like osteen or you want to or you're doing this because you really want to reach the masses and i think that's more probably the case with yusuf i don't know him i've never met him it, like but that's just kind of my reading of him is that he's really interested in kind of appealing to a broad segment but he's not after i mean he's not he's not doing it because of money, right? I mean, that's not like his books are, you know, number one bestsellers on Amazon. Um, but, you know, there is that whole kind of thing of like, how do we appeal to the consumer, right? And so they're using a particular language. There's also some examples in the book about, um, you know, kind of these pastor preneurs, I don't know what you call them, guru preneurs maybe, <laughs> that are um, in other places like India that, that use kind of universalistic, language to appeal to a broad segment. So they're not just appealing to like one religious group, right? They're appealing to many because they want to try to kind of kind of use that universalistic language. That's why capitalism has been so successful in commodifying human religion without uh, all those negative associate negative connotations associated with religion. I guess it's uh, being kind of a new agey thing, spirituality, still a form of religion, but not maybe an institutionalized set of ideas. Right. Uh, and I loved that chapter of your book about Rumi, especially being Iranian. I do come across people, and when if, if they want to come across as area diet, the first thing they tell me is, yeah, I know Rumi, and they give me a quote. And I'm not a Rumi expert by no means, right. but I can tell it's so much not Rumi. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it, it was an interesting point that you've brought up in the book about some of the translators. And there was an article in New York Times a couple of years ago as well as uh, uh, New York Times about erasure of Islam. I think it was called erasure of Islam from Rumi. Uh -huh. uh, unlike um, previous translators such as Nicholson or Arbery, the new translators did not speak Farsi or Arabic, did not know Islam at all. They simply read the translation and reinterpreted the way they wanted. So what is this uh, Lord with Rumi that everybody from Trump's daughter to Oprah Winfrey quote from him? 
Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting about Rumi. I mean, one of the things that I would say is, I mean, I'm a scholar who, you know, studied Arabic and that's what I kind of did for my official language for my PhD. And then I studied Persian and I studied Persian to the kind of the point, I mean, I'm very rusty now. So I could say things like Titoristi and Khobam and like that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> I like probably would have trouble with, you know, um, an extensive conversation. But even at the point when I was taking Persian and we were doing things like writing our own Persian lyrics and poems and translating, I mean, I don't know that I would feel comfortable with somebody like Rumi, like taking that on, but yet you have these people that don't know any Persian, right? Um, that are doing it. And I mean, I think that's one of the, I mean, one of the things about a figure like Rumi and being, you know, Sufism being viewed as a universal, universalistic tradition that kind of speaks to everybody. I mean, that's like true, right? Like he's the most popular poet in the world, um, but it's also really problematic because some of those translations are actually people, you know, reading a translated, a couple lines or stanzas or whatever of translated Rumi, and then they're inspired to do their own translation. And so it's kind of like, and in a way it's, you know, it kind of reminds me of, you know, Saeed has this book on expertise and Islam in the media kind of reminds me of that whole thing of like, well, just anybody can do this. You know, you don't have to have any expertise, you know? Um, and, you know, that's, I mean, I think that's one of the thing, things that's going on. And I remember having this experience many, many years ago and it was before I had like officially converted to Islam and I was living in New Mexico and um, I saw that there was this event that was, it was like a get together to, you know, to learn about Rumi. And so I showed up at this house. It was like this very fancy house in Albuquerque. And I walked in and there was all these people like standing around, you know, drinking wine, reading Rumi, like an English translation. And I just thought, yeah, I don't think this is quite what I'm look <laughs> looking for. Um, but, you know, there's a whole culture of that, right? And, you know, I think one of the things I also point out in the book is that I'm really sympathetic to, and I say this at the beginning of the book and I say it at the end, I also admit that I am, you know, I am, you know, a participator in the search for, a participant in the search for enchantment. I get, I get the whole thing about modernity is really hard. Like I get that and I believe that, you know, and I think, you know, there's a number of scholars that have talked about, you know, raw conscripts of modernity and it's, you know, this very kind of difficult condition, the condition of modernity. I believe all that and I understand the search for enchantment. Like I understand that. And I, I mean, I will, I say at the end of the book, you know, I'm a fairly cynical scholar, but uh, pretty much every time that my family and I have gone to Indonesia, we go to Bali. And then if we don't go, we kind of feel like, I know, kind of not unsettled exactly, but like, oh, we really should have gone, you know? And so there are these places where there's something about them that's very, um, I don't know, enriching or very soothing or something. And so I get that, you know? And so one of the things that I don't want, you know, people to think about the book, and I don't think most people are thinking this, is that I'm, you know, against all like search, you know, all these searches for enchantment. But I do think one of the things that happens is that um, is that people, you know, colonize these traditions, right? So they're like, well, I'm going to take this part of the tradition that I like, and I'm not going to do any of this other stuff. And they're going to kind of like take on the, these identities, right? And that's one thing that I think is problematic because it is a form of colonialism. And then I think the other thing that happens is that in the products that are created, there are things that are deeply offensive. So um, for example, if you are somebody that is kind of really into um, like into, I don't know, yoga culture, kind of new age yoga culture, and you know, you're really like, you have all these whatever statues and coffee cups of the Buddha on them in your house and you're like, well, I want more stuff. You know, I mean, one of the things that I saw at one point was a skateboard with an image 
of the Buddha on it. And it's just like, yeah, you don't put your foot on the face of the Buddha. You know, it's these kinds of things are problematic. And there's a number of examples um, in the book. And this happens with Hinduism and Islam as well. It's just like, there's just no care kind of taken. One of the reasons there's no care taken is because people don't really know that much about the tradition, right? So they just think like Rumi's this cool poet, like Buddha, you know, whatever they may connect with yoga, even though it's really a Hindu thing or whatever, you know? And so they don't really have a good grasp of the tradition. And one of the things that I talk about at the beginning is this kind of dilettantism where it's like, well, when people say I'm, you know, spiritual, but not religious, and they say like, I'm a mystic and they're, you know, 22 years old. One of the things that they're often engaging in is like, I'm going to do a yoga retreat in Santa Fe for, you know, a weekend. Then I'm going to, you know, go to whatever Boulder and do some kind of Boulder, Colorado is a big place for this, you know, do some kind of, you know, five day intensive class on Rumi. And then, you know, next year I'm going to go to Bali, you know, kind of thing. And so there, there also is a lot of this kind of spiritual shopping and to go to your point of capitalism, this is really useful for capitalism because if people are ne never satisfied and they go from one thing to the next, there's just kind of an endless cycle of purchasing products, right? And there's this idea I talk about called liquid modernity, which is this um, concept from this really interesting philosopher. And one of the things that he writes about is how that's part of, that's part of liquid modernity is there's, there's not any satisfaction from the marketplace. So you just kind of buy this product that's unsatisfactory. Then you go to another product, then you go to another product. And I mean, I think that's one of the reasons that, that, um, modern mysticism is such a huge part of the marketplace now, right? Because it's perfect for that. Because if you aren't really doing the work, which is probably going to take you, you know, like 40 years to do it, right? To get anywhere on a spiritual path um, significant, then you're just going to be dissatisfied, right? You're going to go from one product to another. So it's all kind of, you know, connected to, um, you know, to, this idea of immediatism, like you're going to get this immediate thing. And then if you don't, you're just satisfied to go to the next thing. Thanks. So it's quick, quick, quick fix for the elements of modernity in a way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know, from, I mean, you know, this, like from studying any religious tradition, if you're really looking at doing serious, you know, religious work or spiritual work, this is a, this is a long path. I mean, we all know people who have been on the path for a long time and they are definitely not there yet right i mean they're like maybe they've been working on it but they they still have a long way to go so <laughs> they've been doing it 40 years you know and they still have their issues um then you're definitely not going to get get anywhere significant you know with you know a set of roomy cds that are recited by madonna and whoever else you know I'm glad you mentioned that because I, what I liked about your book was that you are very critical of these practices, but you're not totally dismissive and you do provide some explanation of why this is happening. And I find it interesting that these kind of uh, the butchered versions of these traditions have also seeped into, into countries like Iran. I don't know about India or uh, East uh, Asian, other Asian countries, but I've seeped into Iran as well, where you have all these people who identify themselves as, as Sufis, they're a mystic, and they have this reductive or sometimes even erroneous uh, conceptions about about those practices. And I, I've I used to do some research on ecofeminism, and when it came to spiritual ecofeminism, this, they were also met with the same kind of uh, critiques that they are reductively misappropriating traditions of, especially native indigenous cultures, uh, uh, Native Americans. Um, and uh, the way they practice them is like a new age uh, kind of a yoga or a new age environmentalism, which doesn't really solve the issues of uh, the pressing issues of the day. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sophia. Just before we say goodbye, I was wondering if there is any other project or monograph you're currently working on, if you'd like to talk about that. I am. I'm actually working on this project 
Um, I went, I, my, um, part of my family's Indonesian, my husband. And, um, so we have family there and we spend a lot of time there. And, um, I have been working on this project for a while. <laughs> it kind of got, it kind of got, um, stalled because it, I just had a baby about a year ago. <laughs> like, um, so that kind of slowed stuff down and then the pandemic, but I had done all this field work um, in Indonesia, mostly on Java and Lombok. Um, and and what, I, what, what the kind of book is about is, and it's kind of in the early stages, are um, stories that people tell that are um, linked to, Indonesian history um, and linked to memory um, and how those how those are kind of embedded in religious practices. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good way to explain it. And so I, they're they're almost kind of like case studies. So like for example, I have a chapter on on essentially like Indonesian sainthood. So like how do these different types of you know individuals how do they kind of function in people's memory? And how do people kind of keep the memory of those individuals alive, right? Or keep them going? And, and how are they kind of located in, in religious practices? And then there's another chapter um, yeah, on pilgrimage. And so, you know, how are these pilgrimages kind of situated in different, you know, different histories? And it's it's a pretty big project. So I it's late and the 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 publisher who's Oxford gave me an extension. I am not quite sure it's gonna, gonna get, I'm gonna meet it. Um, but that that's kind of the main thing that I'm working on, um, working on right now. And it's, it's very slow going because there's a lot of uh, translations that I have to do. Um, and I'm a pretty slow, pretty slow translator. And there's just, a, there's a lot of different, um, different kind of links to make because I'm trying to basically link everything to these interviews that I did over a number of years. Well, sounds so like that will come out someday. <laughs> <laughs> but I think um, I think it's probably going to be a while. And mm. and the one thing I will say about it is that one of the things I'm trying to do with that project is to contest the notion that there is like a one normative tradition of Islam, and that. Um, you know, people in Southeast Asia or people in West Africa or people in these other places, they're not doing Islam right. It's something I really dislike about, you know, our field is this kind of notion of like, there's one correct tradition and then there's these outlier people and they do weird stuff. And, and so I'm, you know, one of the things I'm trying to do is make the argument of, well, this is the largest Muslim country in the world. So if you're going to say that, then I'm going to say that this is the normative, you know, tradition, but um, I'm, I mean, I'm very excited about the project and it's a really, really, really fun project, but it's definitely, um, you know, definitely going to be a, a while. Before. Sounds like a very exciting project, and especially with what you mentioned about religion, because people always have this misconception that there is this Platonic essentialist version of a religion that everybody has to subscribe to. Anything that departs from that is not a true religion in a way. <laughs> Thank you yeah. for your time, uh, Sophia. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you about the project, about your project. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Have a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you.